So hello everyone, thanks for coming to my presentation. My name is Matej Sakmary, I'm from Czech Technical University in Prague, and today I would like to talk to you about real-time rendering of atmosphere and clouds using Vulkan. I would like to start by showing you some motivational pictures, which I try to replicate as closely as possible in my implementation. The goals were to create a model which would be realistic and convincing, physically based, and parameterizable so that we could represent the change in time of day, change in weather, and would be flexible enough so that we could represent uh, conditions which might be present on other planets such as Mars and fictional planets. Lastly, the model needed to be dynamic so that we could visualize the change in any of these parameters in real time. Because we wanted our model to be physically based, I will now need to explain some of the physical laws that make up the visual look of the sky and atmosphere. But what actually is an atmosphere? Well, atmosphere is a layer of particles such as water droplets, dust particles and other molecules. As the photons travel through this layer, they collide with said particles. This collision can be of two types. First, the photon might be absorbed by the particle, which means it will no longer continue to travel through the atmosphere. Second, the photon might be scattered, which means it will still continue to travel through the atmosphere, but its path will be altered. Now I would like to actually formulate the mathematical description. Uh, fair warning, there will be some integrals, but I promise I will be brief, and there are pretty pictures in the end of the presentation as a reward. So, to actually model the absorption and scattering properties of the particles, we use absorption and scattering coefficients. Furthermore, we define an extinction coefficient, which is just given as the sum of the respective absorption and scattering coefficients. If we then integrate this extinction coefficient along some path between points x1 and x2, negate it and trace it to the exponential function, we get transmittance. Transmittance is a unitless parameter which ranges from 0 to 1 and directly corresponds to the light attenuation along said path. Using this, we can start to model our final equation. We want to get the light arriving into some point x from direction omega. We just take the light which arrives there and multiply it by the transmittance between the point x and x0, which is the origin of our path. So far, however, we only account for the extinction properties of the particles. But when a photon gets outscattered from one path, it also gets inscattered into another path. To account for this, we need to add further terms to our equation. To get the amount of inscattered light in a single position, we need to integrate the entire sphere of directions. However, as not all, uh, not, not all particles scatter uniformly, we also need to weigh this by phase function denoted by P. An example of a particle which is not scattering uniformly might be a water droplet which scatters strongly forward. Next, we need to integrate this again to uh, account for all the points along our path weighed by the scattering coefficient and the transmittance, and we arrive to the final form of our equation. But how do we actually solve this equation to get the desired look of our sky? Well, analytical solution is impossible, so we need to reach to some other methods. In our work, we use a method called ray marching. Ray marching generates a number of steps along a ray. At each of these steps, we evaluate the medium and calculate the local light contribution. We then assume this light contribution is constant along the entire step, and by summing up these local light contributions, we get our integration result. Specifically, we use a method proposed by Sebastian Hilaire, which uses a set of pre-computed lookup tables to speed up the ray marching process. The first lookup table, called the transmittance lookup table, stores pre-computed transmittance in discrete points in the atmosphere for discrete uh, sun directions. The second lookup table, which is parameterized similarly to the first one, stores again in scattered amount of light at discrete points in the atmosphere for discrete sun angles. Third, we pre-calculate the sky view lookup table. By utilizing the fact that the sky is of very low visual frequency, we can render it into low resolution texture, which is then only later upscaled to the monitor of the screen. By doing this, we reduce the computational complexity and don't introduce any visual uh, artifacts. 
Last, we pre-calculate the area perspective lookup table. This is a volumetric lookup table with slices very similar to the Skyview lookup table. The slices are fitted to the camera frustum, and this texture is later used to render the atmospheric effects. To actually generate the lookup tables, we submit a single command buffer each frame. Uh, as we have no use for the raster features of our pipeline, we generate uh, all of the lookup tables using compute shaders. Please also notice that there is inherent ordering between the specific lookup tables. The transmittance results are needed when calculating the multiscattering, and the transmittance and multiscattering are needed when calculating the sky view and aerial perspective. So we need to insert two GPU to GPU synchronization points into our command buffer to ensure the correct ordering. To render the clouds, we leverage the same physical principles as when rendering the atmosphere. So the rendering equation stays the same. However, we cannot make the same simplifications. This is because of two reasons. First, because the clouds are not perfectly symmetrical spherically, as opposed to the atmosphere, we cannot pre-compute parts of the rendering equation into low-resolution uh, lookup tables. Second, because the clouds are of much higher visual frequency than the actual atmosphere, the low-resolution rendering method is very limited. Instead, we use a method proposed by Schneider and Voss. We use two volumetric noise textures to model the clouds. The first is of higher resolution and is used to model the base shape of the clouds. The second, low resolution one, is then used to erode the edges of these base shapes to create the high frequency visual detail. Each noise texture has four channels and each channel stores inverted Worli noise of varying frequencies. We then use this to model the density of the clouds when remarching the cloud layer. To generate the Worli noise textures, we again submit a single command buffer. However, as opposed to the atmospheric lookup tables, we only calculate this once at the startup of our application. This is done because the calculation can be quite expensive. Uh, each of the channels stores uh, independent frequencies, so we can generate them again independently and then only need to synchronize once before normalizing and combining them into a single four-channel texture. Okay, now I would actually like to describe the process that draws the sky. This process consists of a single render pass which is further split into four subpasses. The first subpass draws all the objects of our scene. In our case, this is only the terrain, however, our method supports arbitrary number of objects. Second, the atmosphere and the sun is drawn. By sampling the depth texture from the first subpass, we can see which fragments are not obstructed by the scene objects. There we can safely upscale the sky view lookup table we pre-calculated. The sun is also drawn as a separate effect during this pass. It is important to notice that the sun is not drawn as a part of the Skyview lookup table. This is because upscaling would cause artifacts. The third subpass draws the clouds. We again sample the depth texture from the first subpass to collect the order between the objects and the clouds in the scene so they overlap uh, correctly. It is also important to draw the clouds only after we draw the atmosphere so that we ensure the correct blending between semi-transparent parts of the clouds and the atmosphere. Last, by using the fragment position and its depth, we sample the aerial perspective lookup table and apply the atmospheric effects. I'm not sure how much it's visible in this given... Yeah, okay. Um, but there is one problem. I just said that we need the fragment depth to correctly offset into the aerial perspective lookup table and apply the effects. We also need to apply the effects for the clouds to ensure a coherent look of the scene. But we have no information about the depth of the clouds stored in the depth buffer because we remarch the clouds and not rasterize them. Furthermore, we don't actually know what the depth of the cloud is. Clouds are volumetric and semi-transparent, so they have no clear defining uh, starting and ending point. To fix this issue, we experimented with three techniques. First, we only tried to store the depth of the first sample which exceeded some density threshold. While this worked, 
the amount of visual detail we were able to store in the depth buffer was very low. To try to improve on this, we stored the transmittance weight average depth. This just means that at each sample we take the depth, weigh it by the current transmittance, and then calculate the average of all these weight samples. This increases the visual detail we are able to store in the depth buffer, but it also introduces undesired edge artifacts around the borders of the clouds. So, to fix this, we apply a third step. Before we store the depth buffer, uh, we, before we store the depth into the depth buffer, we linearly interpolate the final depth with the maximum depth based on the final transmittance. This basically smooths out the edges of the semi-transparent parts of the clouds while preserving the detail in the depth texture. So we remove our undesired artifacts. This is the diagram of the frame. Most notably, uh, in the cloud subpass, we use two depth textures. This is because we need to read the depth from the previous subpass, but we also need to store the modified depth which contains the information about the clouds. So we uh, generate a second depth texture which is then passed to the aerial perspective to correctly apply the effects to the entire scene. Now I would like to present the pretty pictures I promised earlier. So in the top row we can see two sunset scenes where on the left we can see the sun is right uh, above the horizon so we can see the typical golden colors and on the right picture we can see a scene where the sun has fallen beyond the horizon so no significant amount of light hits the terrain but the clouds are still lit. On the bottom left, we can see an image depicting stormy conditions, and bottom right, we can see some atmosphere of an alien planet, which is much, much denser, and the cloud layer is much thicker. Lastly, I would like to present you with a video of how my application works. We can see that we can set the position of the sun to whatever we like, and the model reacts uh, accordingly. We can also modify the parameters of the atmosphere, such as the density and various scattering and absorption coefficients of the particles that consist of the, uh, the atmosphere. And we can also play with the tone mapping curve and the tone mapping operators, which we use when converting from high dynamic range to low dynamic range before presenting. Lastly, we also have parameters which allow us to modify the cloud layer. We can set the cloud layer start and the cloud layer end height. We can set the cloud densities we can set the cloud density thresholds, which basically translates to the cloud coverage. And we can also play with the parameters which set the scale of the noise we use and the specific weights that we use to combine the individual channels of the noise to actually form the shape of the clouds. Okay, so to conclude, I presented you with a fully parameterizable model which uses a set of lookup tables to speed up the remarching of the atmosphere. We use pre-computed volumetric noise to render the and model the clouds. And most importantly, all of it was real-time and dynamic so that we could see the change in any of its parameters in real-time. So that's it for me. Thank you for your attention and I would now like to answer your questions. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions? You didn't say anything about performance. I didn't say anything. Yeah, yeah you're right. So the atmosphere rendering is actually very fast. Uh, it takes like a sub one millisecond to render the to render all the lookup tables and the atmosphere. I'm pretty sure the each of the lookup tables takes like from 300 microseconds to 50 microseconds. This is all done on 1080, uh, G uh, GeForce 1080. And uh, as for the clouds, the situation is much worse. So uh, the performance is very varying uh, based on the density of the clouds, as well as the thickness of the layer. So it can range usually from the ground views, it's like three to six milliseconds to remarge the cloud layer but uh, it can spike to like 16 to 24 milliseconds whenever you uh, get to the worst case scenario where you actually have to remarge the full layer and can't early out because of the density of the clouds. Yeah, there's more details about this in the paper, so. 
So um, you said that you uh, did some tricks for the for the depth because the uh, the cloud does not have a single depth value. Yes. Um, would you still be able to have correct depth uh, compositing with the rest of, of the scene? For example, when uh, uh, the, the clouds are uh, simultaneously in front of and behind of uh, of a mountain, something like that. Would that work? Uh, yes. Uh, the clouds take the depth texture from the first pass and they compare it with their own depth. So uh, whenever we ha have like a mountain peak uh, which pokes through the cloud layer, we can actually correctly stop the ray march um, when we hit the uh, cloud peak. Uh, sorry, the mountain peak. Mm -hmm. So it would be like a blend between these depths probably. It wouldn't yeah, it would not be the exact depth of, uh, of, of the hill, but that's kind of correct, right? Because like the cloud adds a bit depth to in front of the peak. So, so it would be somewhere in, in, in between the, the start of the cloud layer and the mountain peak. OK, any other questions? Um, then maybe one que last question from me. Um, so you were using procedurally generated 3D noise textures. Have you considered any other representation for the clouds, like uh, a neural representation or a particles or something like that? Uh, yes, I considered a particle representation uh, which might have great benefits with, uh, g uh, like in regards of the realisticity of the clouds because you could then simulate like wind effects when the, the, the particles would like blow off, off of a, like again a, a, a cloud cloud uh, a mountain peak covered in the cloud. However, um, unfortunately, there is no time for that given the cloud rendering already is like the bottleneck of the application. If I also try to run like a particle simulation, uh, I would be nowhere near uh, uh, real time frame rates. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.